Um, my name is Jane Devilhois, and I'm the chair of Asia Art Archive, for those of you who um, we haven't met. Um, we have this small space, as you can see, it's underlined small space here in New York, to do these kinds of programming. It's, we're a nonprofit organization, um, but are uh, here in New York, and also in Hong Kong. And actually, our main space is in Hong Kong where we have actually a library and an archive and a series of uh, materials, research materials, and programs focusing on recent art from Asia. So we cover all of Asia, but we have certain areas where we specialize. I love this music. Um, all right. <laughs> um, so here in New York, we do programs mostly like this, although we have a small reading room and, and uh, focusing again on uh, recent art from Asia. I'm delighted today uh, to be introducing two people. Um, one of them is uh, well known to many of you, and one of them is probably not as well known to everybody. <laughs> Very well. Um, but will be someday. Okay. Um, I'll introduce Richard Vine first. Richard Vine is managing, is managing editor of Art in America magazine and is a prolific writer. Um, many articles, reviews, and interviews. He's written an extremely important book called New Art, New, uh, New China, New Art, um, which is a good survey of emerging uh, art in um, mainland China, experimental art in mainland China from, from the Cultural Revolution or after the Cultural Revolution, more or less the present day, or when you wrote it, which yeah. was the present day at that point. Also, a uh, murder and mystery <laughs> called Soho Sins. I urge you all to read it. Um, it talks about the art world in the 1990s, and we don't know whether Richard features in any of these characters, there, but we'll let you all figure it out. Um, Richard Vine was a was a uh, active participant in the uh, 1970 May 4th anti-war demonstrations at Kent State, which many of you in this room, amazingly, are old enough to remember. Um, it's not normally the case for many of our audiences. Um, but there are many people here in this room who probably don't remember that date, and so I think this is very interesting. It will be an interesting conversation. Um, and he will tell you about what happened. I think I'll leave it at, at, at that. Um, to be in discussion, to give a presentation, and then hopefully to be in discussion with all of you, and I want to emphasize that this is meant to be a conversation. Um, to be in discussion with you is an artist from Vietnam who is here in the United States, uh, supported by the Asia Asian Culture Council, um, which supports cultural exchange in uh, between Asia and the United States. And Tran Minh Duc um, is an artist who grew up in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, educated there, and didn't know about the anti-war protests, uh, Vietnamese anti-war protests uh, in the United States when he was growing up found out about them later in life and has made it part of his project, part of his artistic practice, and art, to do research on that and has gone to Penn State. From our perspective, this is extremely interesting, not because, not just because you're really fascinating emerging artists from Vietnam, and that is very much true, but the whole issue around suppressed histories, invisible histories, is something that people interested in archives are often focused on and who writes the histories, and how are the histories um, written. So here you have a situation where many of you in this room remember this, and it was a seminal moment. Here you have someone from Vietnam who did not realize or wasn't told the history of the anti-war protest at that time was told a different history. So it brings up a lot of questions of what it is, in fact, um, we are led to believe we are told. Okay, so um, tonight's format is going to be presentation by Richard, a presentation by Duke, and then we will open it up to questions and <coughs> really, truly uh, think of questions, write them down if you don't remember my questions. Um, and um, I will also urge you to participate by calling on you. Um, <laughs> and as Richard knows, I do do that. <laughs> um, but really, it's meant to be a conversation, so we will. Um, they look forward to the question and answer afterwards. So 15, 10 to 15 minutes of presentation each, and then conversation. So thank you all for coming, and Richard, and thank you very much for um, being here. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I thought perhaps the most efficient way to approach this as someone who writes mysteries um, is to think of it as the Kent State mystery, um, because I think there are four major questions that come 
on anyone's mind in thinking about these events. Um, first of all, why Kent State of all places? I mean, who ever heard of it before? Who has ever heard of it afterwards? And why then? What was it about this particular meeting? Third, what exactly happened? And I didn't mean exactly. <laughs> and fourth, who is to blame? So, with those questions in mind, the entrance to Kent State, um, a, obviously a state university in the Midwest, it occurred to me this morning that perhaps I should begin with a slide of Ohio, since this is a New York audience. <laughs> <laughs> Kent, the city, is halfway between New York and Chicago, exactly. But more interestingly, the state of Ohio borders on its north a little bit of Michigan and a lot of Lake Erie, and on the other side is Canada, our peaceful friends to the north. But in the south, you have the Ohio River, and on the other side of the Ohio River, you have Kentucky and West Virginia. So that is already something of a peculiar cultural mix. <clears throat> and a lot of the factories in northeastern Ohio at that time employed men who had come up from Appalachia, uh, bringing certain orientations and values with them. Um, Kent is a place betwixt and between, in other senses, um, the area around it looks agricultural. You know, ordinarily, if you look out the window, <coughs> you see flat fields, some farms, and beyond them, the woods. And if you've read your Faulkner, you would have some sense of what the woods mean in a context like that. But at the same time, it was a highly developed industrial area. Um, Akron, Canton, Warren, Niles, Youngstown, these are all major manufacturing centers, primarily of tire making and steel manufacture at that time. Um, <clears throat> so it was considered a sign of prosperity in those days to drive down the road and see factory smokestacks with smoke belching out of it, <laughs> or at night, you know, sparks and flames. Um, you know, you felt really gratified and when and it was a time of rising affluence after World War II <clears throat> up until this point. It's changed very much since then, as you can probably imagine. Um, the local situation was also divided. There were approximately 25,000 students at the university, uh, a university that admitted anybody with a high school diploma in the state of Ohio. Didn't mean you wouldn't flunk out, but you would be admitted. <laughs> um, and the city of Kent was also about 25,000 people. But in those days, perhaps in all days, there was a serious divide <clears throat> between town and gown. Uh, people who made their living working in factories, and people who you know, spent four years lolling about <laughs> uh, studying and having fun, or so it seemed to be local populace. There was also, of course, ex explosive growth in universities at this time. <clears throat> um, so that you ended up with a, even a sort of physically divided environment. You had the old front campus, the kind of stately buildings of ivy and that sense of sanctuary that college used to be. But then you also had the back campus which was developed like this. This is called Tri Towers in the area. Um, and looks like, you know, like an urban development. So psychologically, students were also sort of torn between the idea of sanctuary and study on the one hand and social engagement on the other. And of course the great byword in those days was you were supposed to be relevant. <laughs> Um, and we had, when I first arrived in 66, 
know, you still had traditions like the freshman beanie. I'm probably the last person <laughs> who has ever worn a freshman beanie. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, a seal of the university on the sidewalk at Prentice Gate. And, you know, the legend was if you stepped on it, you would have to clean it with a tooth brush. Um, and women's dorms had curfews. Uh, and if women wanted to leave on the weekend, they had to sign out specifying where they were going with whom, et cetera, et cetera. Then I went away for one year, 68, 69. I came back one year later, they had co-ed dorms. <laughs> um, the entire attitude had changed, and there was something of a small political activity going on, including visits from people like this. <laughs> Mark Rudd, uh, who led the, the strike at Columbia, came as did many other people, and so did Jerry Rubin. Now, three days before Jerry Rubin came to Kent, in California, Governor Ronald Reagan uh, was reflecting upon the police and guard reaction to the People's Park disturbances. And he said, if there's going to be a bloodbath, let's get it over with. No more appeasement. Meanwhile, three days later, Jerry Rubin comes to Kent State, which he called Kent State Prison, <laughs> and he said, you can't begin to free yourself until you kill your parents. <laughs> so this is the kind of rhetoric that was in the air, and I think it's one of the responsible factors for what happened subsequently. Um, as I said, there was a small, very small radical faction at Kent State, uh, and at the SCS chapter of Students' Democratic Society. Um, one of their more notable actions was they announced, in an effort to bring the war home, they were going to napalm a dog so that people could see what the effect of napalm was and they could think about what we were doing in Vietnam. In fact, they never produced a dog, and, you know, but the police turned out, the Animal Protected League turned out. Meanwhile, young men are being drafted and sent off to do those things and be subjected to those things. That takes us to Thursday, April 30th, the night that Richard Nixon on television, announced a new policy. And you know, the war in Vietnam had been going on for many years at this point. <clears throat> um, and he pointed out that down here on the border of Cambodia, there were pockets where North Vietnamese soldiers could cross over into South Vietnam, launch attacks, and then go back to these refuges in Cambodia and in effect that's enough of this. They've been secretly bombing Cambodia for about a year at this point. <clears throat> but now he publicly announced that we're going to bring in ground troops and clean out these sanctuaries. He also, in a, an aside, took time uh, to complain about anti-war demonstrations and disruptions on American campuses. And on Friday, this is on Thursday, on Friday, speaking casually to some office workers, he used the expression bums, these campus bums. Now, a couple of things personally interesting about this. The other thing that we would watch on television every night was the body count in Vietnam. As you may recall, General Westmoreland had decided, you know, we can't really win this as a ground war, you know, you capture some territory, you march on to the capital, that's not working. So we're going to make it a war of attrition, which means the whole point is we kill more of them than they kill of us, and that's how we win. <coughs> and to facilitate the war on attrition, they 
instituted a lottery draft, December 1st, 1969. So all the birthdays were put into a hopper, and they were pulled out one after the other, and you were assigned a number. So in the first go-round, uh, birthdays numbered 1 through 24 were immediately called up for their physical. They eventually got to, I think it was number 241. My number was 93. So I was about to be called up for my physical at this moment. And one of the things, <laughs> at this time, the, war, I mean, the, uh, the age to serve in the military was 18. The age to vote was 21. So you could be sent to war, <laughs> never having had the right to vote in the United States. <laughs> so in response to this, the next day at noon, a kind of ad hoc organization called World Historians Opposed to Racism and Exploitation for <laughs> part of the humor of the time, um, had a little demonstration on campus in which they said, Nixon has, in effect, killed the Constitution by this act, and we're going to bury it. And so they ripped a copy of the Constitution out of the school textbook, and they dug a hole, and made some speeches, and buried the American Constitution, um, which has upset a number of people, even in the crowd. And the crowd was not so great. <laughs> um, very ordinary. This, it's called the Victory Bell, <laughs> and uh, it's an old locomotive bell that um, was supposed to be rung for football victories, of which we had very few, so <laughs> it got put to other use, mostly announcing uh, political rallies. Well, um, that was a quiet, peaceful demonstration, but they also announced that we will have another larger demonstration on Monday at noon here. That night, everybody goes downtown, of course, you know, the strip of bars. People are drinking, which people do. And somewhere in the middle of the night, someone makes a bonfire in the middle of the street. And there's a motorcycle gang called the Chosen Few who starts riding the motorcycles around and through the bonfire. And the mayor talks to his police chief and says, what should we do? You know, he's got about 20 police, 15 or 20 police in total. Um, and they decide, well, what we should do is close the bars. Which on one hand seems like a sensible response, right? <laughs> but this whole weekend is full of unanticipated consequences, right? Well, what happens when you push a thousand to fifteen hundred semi enumerated young people out into the street <laughs> on Friday night. Um, what actually happened was that people became very rowdy and they started breaking windows. <clears throat> and they broke 47 windows downtown. Um, police from various jurisdictions came in and eventually pushed everyone back to campus. Um, 15 people were arrested. But more importantly, Mayor Satrum contacted the National Guard and said, we may have a situation here. And they immediately sent an emissary who arrived at like a 3 a.m. in the morning and conferred with Mayor Satrum and said, okay, if you want the National Guard tomorrow, you have to decide by 5 o'clock. So, on Saturday, May 2nd, it was a strange circumstance because they decided to have a curfew and they made an early curfew downtown, 8 o'clock. No students downtown after 8 o'clock. But on campus, it was 1 o'clock, which means that everyone is now concentrated on campus. Right? And what's in the middle of campus? This old barracks building, wooden that's used for reserve officers training for. I know this is a program where you take some military training, 
the army gives you some money for school, and afterwards you serve your stint. This was a big focus for political dissent, as you can imagine. Um, there's another building here, Taylor Hall, it looks a little bit like the Parthenon in the distance. It's going to become very important as we go along. This is Blanket Hill, so named because that's where you went with your sweetheart and your blanket. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of rumors during the day. Um, certain news photographers were told you should stick around because Rossi is going to burn at 8 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, people began to gather. By 8.30, Rossi was burning. One of the smaller mysteries is who exactly did this? Never been answered. I mean, we know that there were a bunch of students there, but who instigated the land? You know, these were the actual flames. Um, is anybody in No. There was uh, guns and ammunition inside. So the ammunition started going off, which added to the confusion. The, uh, the fire department comes, and the students begin to struggle with the firemen, taking their hoses, cutting the hoses. So the fire department leaves. Uh, eventually they're sent back, and eventually they subdue the fire. So it seems. They leave again, and then mysteriously, the fire reignites. And at that point, they brought in the National Guard. You see here the Army personnel carrier. They brought seven of these. In the first wave, there were 800 guardsmen. Eventually, there were 1,300. Uh, 138 trucks. 12 military helicopters. Um, and this night, there were 30 arrests. 15 the first night, 30. Sunday, May 3rd, was a very, very peculiar day. First of all, you have the Rossi ruins now. This is what it looks like afterwards. And now you have the governor of the state of Ohio flying in in a helicopter. Here the guardsmen parting the ruins. This is Governor James Rhodes in his second term as governor of Ohio at this point. <clears throat> and he's inspecting the damage to the guns there that, you know, the stock all burned away and then they left with just the metal barrels of the guns that were stored in the Rocky building. <clears throat> now he had decided that he was tired of being governor and he wanted to run for Senate. So he was in a primary race against Robert Taft comes from a very distinguished political family in Ohio. His, his grandfather was president of the United States and chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um, so Rhodes was running seven points behind Taft. And it occurred to him that taking a strong law and order stance would help his standings in the election. And that's exactly what he did. But this was something he was accustomed to doing. Um, during his terms, Governor Rhodes called out the National Guard 40 times. It's more than any other governor in the, in the United States. He's also got other problems on his mind. Four days earlier, Kent, not, Ohio State University has exploded into protests, actually much more severe than the protests at Kent. Uh, and he ends up sending 2,800 guards to Ohio State. And they sort of battle it out for 11 days. Uh, and eventually, 10 people are wounded. Gunfire, none of them fatal, unfortunately. <clears throat> so on Monday morning, he called a press conference in the fire department and literally pounded the table uh, and said, we're not putting up with this anymore. The state of Ohio is taking over. These people, 
weather moon and other processor types um, are worse than the brown shirts, worse than the night riders, worse than the vigilantes. And we're not going to treat the symptoms, we're going to eradicate the cause. And we're going to do it by any means necessary. With him at that time I was General Del Corso. I'm not 100% sure of this identification, but this is the picture that comes up for Del Corso on the internet. I'm not entirely convinced. In any case, what kind of guy is Del Corso? He's a man who fought at Guadalcanal, who became a battalion commander in the Philippines, and personally received the Japanese surrender in Busan, the largest of the Philippine Islands. So this is not you know, some local law enforcement officer. This is a war-hardened veteran who's now in charge of the guard. That might seem like a bad thing. <laughs> On the other hand, when he left, he left in charge another general, Robert Canterbury, who had no combat experience. A kind of a paper soldier. And he, no doubt, felt himself between the rock and the hard place. He's got the governor founding the table. He's got Del Corso, who said in the same firehouse meeting, we will use any means necessary, including shooting. We we'll hope it doesn't come to that, but if it does, we will. Um, by this time, the president of the university was long gone. He, he had left on Friday to attend some meetings in Iowa. <coughs> and remember, this is the era before cell phones and computers and email. So when somebody was gone, they were kind of gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could call them up, uh, you know, try to get them to the phone, etc. I don't know. Um, so it became evident to everyone that the guard was in charge. There was no one else. <laughs> and this is what the campus looked like at that time. This is Prince's Gate, as you saw at the beginning. <laughs> with an APC in front of it. Um, oddly enough, the afternoon of May 3rd was what many people refer to as the carnival. Because a lot of tourists came who had heard about the burning of the Rossi building the night before. And they came to see. And, you know, these are young soldiers. It's a campus full of young co-eds. There was a lot of flirtation, Fraternization back and forth, joking back and forth, until the sun went down. And then everything turned nasty. Um, and that night there were 68 arrests. So we're now up to about 113 arrests. And then we come to the So. When you went to class on the morning of May 4th, there were armed guardsmen standing at the entrance to your classroom, not your classroom, your class building. <clears throat> and uh, there were troops deployed around the Rossi building. And who are these guys? These are National Guards. What does that mean? It means they're local factory workers, firemen. Some of them are college students. At least one of them, probably more, are Kent State college students. And they're in the National Guard, some of them out of a sense of patriotism, most of them as a way of avoiding active duty <laughs> in the real army. And look at what how they're equipped. These are not policemen. They have no nightsticks. They have no handcuffs. They have no tasers because it doesn't even invent it yet. They have no rubber bullets. Bullet, rubber bullets were not invented yet. They were used for the first time months later in Northern Ireland. Um, 
what they have, military rifles, M1 military rifles, with 10 inch bayonets, and tear gas. Now, um, the M1 has been a very reliable military rifle for a long period of time, but it was outmoded. In Vietnam, they were using primarily the M16. So believe it or not, it could have been worse. <laughs> the M1 is a semi-automatic rifle, meaning in order to fire it, you have to click your finger each time. It has an eight bullet clip, so you're limited to eight shots before you have to reload. And the ammunition they were carrying was steel jacketed, which sounds terrible in a way, and is, because it's designed to penetrate. The good thing about that is that if you're shot with a steel jacket and round, it tends to go clean through. The M16, had they been carrying M16, have what they call tumbling bullets. So when they strike a surface, they begin to spin inside the body and to, and to carry off and turn away. So here was the situation. <coughs> this is Blanket Hill from Taylor Hall. <coughs> the guards are in this jeep. There's an officer from campus security who goes out in this jeep with a bullhorn and tries to get people to disperse. Now, you know, good liberals that we all are, you know, we probably tend to think, oh, you know, these peaceful protesters, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not how things were, of course. The protests tend to be rude and crude. Um, and see him here, now this is not a good enough copy, but he's given the double finger at this point. So, what are they chanting? They're, they're kind of chanting, pigs off campus, one, two, three, four, we don't want to have any more. And at the end they were chanting, Zee Kyle, Zee Kyle, Zee Kyle, <laughs> to the guard. <laughs> sympathize with the guard, but put yourself in their situation. They've come to Kent State from about 10 days <laughs> of dealing with a wildcat teamster strike in Akron. Now, teamsters are serious people. <laughs> right? um, so, there's been a lot of rock throwing, there's been you know, taking guns off people. Um, then they come to Kent that night, the first thing they see the Rocky Building is blazing on first. Now, they're sent out into this field. Uh, they put on these gas masks, so they have limited vision. They probably hear mostly their own breathing. <coughs> and they're told to lock and load. Now, when a soldier hears lock and load, it means this is serious business. <laughs> right? So they start with uh, the grenade launchers, tear gas. And they begin to launch the tear gas onto Blanket Hill. Ironically, it was a beautiful day. It was like 9 11. It was just crystal clear, blue sky, a prevailing breeze, about 10 or 15 mile per hour breeze, coming this way, 
<laughs> so the gas was blown back on the garden. <laughs> and bear in mind, one of the things that will be said afterwards was that they had reports of potential snipers. Well, if you heard that, imagine being told to go out in this formation <laughs> and walk across an empty lawn. <laughs> they are making their way through the gas. Here are the students fleeing. One of the other things that happened was that the protesters began to pick up the gas canisters and throw them back. <laughs> but finally, of course, the guards cleared the hill. They're going up now to the crest of the hill. Two of the last people over the hill are Allison Krauss and her boyfriend. Allison Krauss. The whole action from the beginning of the rally to the firing of the guns was 24 minutes. And this is what happened. Okay, we started out over here at Rossi, moved across the commons, this big lawn, along the edge, up Blanket Hill, along the edge of Taylor Hall. <coughs> and then they came down here and on to something called the practice football field where, lo and behold, they ran up against a cyclone fence. So now, all of a sudden, they can't advance anymore. Students start filling in the hill behind them. And over here in this parking lot are a small number of people who are really acting up. And then eventually, they will return and we'll talk about that. So while they're on the practice football field, they become so upset that about a third of them went to the firing position. And they're taunted. There's Alan from Fora, who was an activist at the time, waving a black flag. <clears throat> He'll be shot in the wrist. And on the practice football field, you had the same thing. They were launching gas. People were throwing it back on the practice field. And this is their return. So it's literally referred to as the tennis match. The guard at this point thought they were out of gas. They had expended 180 tear gas canisters at this point. One of them actually had eight more, but no one in coming out knew that. Eventually, they decide to leave the practice football field. And they start walking towards the backside of Blanket Hill. I want you to notice the number of people around them, or not around them. There, here they are coming up the backside of Blanket Hill. Now afterwards, many, many, many guardsmen will claim that there was a huge surge of students with rocks and clubs, and they were about to be overpowered, and they fired because they're, you know, they're in fear of their lives. Now they arrive at the top of the hill. <clears throat> This is a little construction by some architecture students called the Pagoda. It's essentially a shaft in a base with a little pointed roof, nine feet tall. <clears throat> but it creates a kind of narrowing between the Pagoda and the edge of Taylor Hall. So as you see, there's some students behind me here. shaft of the pagoda. At a certain point, they begin to turn and see the sky. And so I'm thinking about it, right? Thankfully, it was a little bit crowded, so it wasn't easy for them all to turn. And it wasn't easy for them all to shoot because these guys would have been shooting you know, over the heads of their comrades and in danger of hitting them. So they largely refrain from firing or, as they said, fired into the air. Now here's the moment. And this is a very interesting picture for many reasons. First of all, you have here a sergeant, Myron Pryor. You have here a major, Harry Jones. You have here a colonel, Charles Saffender. And you have here, in a business suit, a general. 
September 10th day. You're a soldier. Who's in charge here? <laughs> One of the mysteries is was there ever an order to fire? Or did they do this spontaneously? This man, Sergeant Fryer, now watch the action between this photo and this one. Claims that he never fired his automatic. He said, I was just pointing it. And my hand was swollen that day, and I couldn't have pointed it or fired it if I wanted to. And besides, it wasn't loaded. Conveniently, his gun was lost at the incident. <laughs> Back up again. Some of the other interesting things about that first picture the people on the roof feeding the fear of snipers, right? And finally, the guardsman taking dead aim on the photographer. Fortunately, he was either a bad shot or restrained himself because the photographer did survive. So here they are, and at this moment, <coughs> for 13 seconds, <coughs> They're firing 67 shots. That's the actual report. And we all know the results of results or things like this. <clears throat> Joe Lewis was the closest person yet. He was 70 feet from the guard's room to the tent in the cabin. And John Cleary, who was shot in the chest, he survived. Joe survived. Cleary survived. Jeff Miller was not survived. Now, when I saw this happen, I immediately assumed that they were firing the blanks. A lot of people did. <coughs> And even as I started to wander down the hillside, and see some of my family, these people are doing weird things on the ground, I thought this is all part of the political theater. This is what we've all been conditioned to do, you know, by the media. We all know our roles here. And it wasn't until I approached the roadway um, that we saw this, and there was, there was some doubt. Ever seen death? This is what it looks like. And over here, you see this young woman approaching, needing to get on it. Let's take pictures. This young woman was not a student. She was a 14 year old runaway from Florida who just happened to be in town. Uh, <coughs> afterwards, Father holds her back to Florida. The governor of the state calls her a communist plant. Um, she had a lot of problems and whatnot. Uh, eventually, married a working class guy and moved to Las Vegas, where she worked as a cashier. And 25 years later, she was reunited with a man who took this photograph, who was a student at that time, John Bilo, who went on to a very distinguished career as a photojournalist. The Associated Press and had a photo um, for CBS. I'm sorry, the next couple of images, you know, this this is a story about a massacre, so there will be blood. <laughs> uh, this is Jeff as he began to bleed out. He'd been shot through the mouth. That's something you couldn't make up in fiction, right? The loud mouth here. And then in one of the most peculiar, <clears throat> that's for the afternoon, another contingent of soldiers from the other side of Taylor Hall comes down to inspect the situation. And they're standing around Jeff Miller's body, and one of them takes his toe and, and prods it to see if there's any response. And they're surrounded by students who are saying to them, what are you guys doing? Are you crazy? Um, at this point, I've been wandering around a lot, and in this picture, it's you can see me coming down the hill again. Just water, you can just see the, the Jeff's water there. 
And one of the responses to all this was by a student named Tom Miller, <clears throat> who, with his black flag, jumped up and down in Jeff Miller's web, and then took his black flag and whipped it in the air so that the web scattered around. <laughs> So of course, you know, in this instance, we always remember the dead, but we should not forget the wounded. There were also nine people wounded. One of them was with Dean Taylor, who was wounded and paralyzed from his chest down. There he is shortly afterwards. There he is not so long ago, having lived all these years in the wheelchair. Another victim, Sandra Scherer, had no involvement with the demonstration. <coughs> she was walking through the class. The people hit by bullets were between 70 and 750 feet from the garden. Most of them around 300 feet. 300 feet is the length of the football field. William, I mentioned earlier, was the, the Eagle Scout. He was actually in Rossi and was just observing. And Alison Krauss, nothing like this incidental bill of the 60s. You know, what would you imagine happened after this? But the one thing that happened, of course, is the ambulance was coming. The first ambulance came from the guardsmen. Because when they were down there originally around Rossi, they had a white ambulance sitting there as a means of visual intimidation, I don't know. Uh, or did they think that their own soldiers were going to be injured and have to be whisked away? I don't know. But that was the first ambulance to go to <coughs> the aid of the wounded. Um, I had been standing at, at right angles to the line of fire, so I thought like this. I saw the charm and I saw the firing. But I assumed it was blanks. So one of the guardsmen turned and faced me. And I had stone in my hand. I don't know if stones that day. In answer to your question of whether I'm stone stone, I can't say it did work. Um, and we had this sort of high glide standoff. I, I distinctly remember him kind of caught in the air with his gun, like, yeah, go ahead, you know? Uh, and I'm still thinking it's theater at this point. But like something out of the Odyssey, I felt that like this spirit came <laughs> and said to me, don't do it. <laughs> don't throw that stone. And I didn't, and he eventually turned and went towards the guardsmen. But that's only the beginning of the, of the strangeness. But then having seen all this, what do you think people would do? You might think any sane person would <laughs> light out for the hills, right? What happened was, once the bodies were taken away, people started to migrate over the crest of the hill back towards the garden with the idea that we would somehow go to them and they would surrender their guns out of the guilt they no doubt felt. Fortunately, there were three faculty members, the only heroes, the only real heroes of this whole catastrophe, who came out literally under a white flag and began to negotiate back and forth between the students and the guardsmen. Uh, one of them, Professor Seymour, said, you know, what you're looking at here are scared kids with guns. <laughs> and when you're dealing with a scared kid with guns, it can only go fast. Another one, my honors college dean, Michael Benign, said, uh, the imminence of slaughter is great. <laughs> Finally, the best of them, in a way, I mean, the most effective of them, uh, Glenn, 
Ben Frank, a geology professor, <clears throat> had the good sense to get people to sit down. Um, this is Ben Frank here. You're going to hear his voice, so the picture's a little out of sync. But he used this megaphone <clears throat> as people were sitting there. And, and you were hearing things from the crowd like, let them splatter us here. And finally he said this. save the day. One was their pleading. The other was the fact that another detachment of guardsmen had shown up behind us. So we were now like, in a pincer's movement with guards closing in from, from both sides. So the only thing left to do was to get out and exit from the side. Bellum, of course, returned in time one day. Who was to blame? Obviously, there's not enough blame to go around here. But there are some specific individuals <clears throat> who have a lot to think about. One is this person, Terry Norman. This is a young student, Penn State student, who habitually took photographs for the police and the FBI. And on May 4th, he was out on the field wearing his mask, which is like a scuba or a you know, scuba mask, uh, and taking pictures. Just taking pictures, of course, alienated people. Like John Pyle, who took the famous picture of the girl screaming in his body, had to thin people off. You know, they were all like, you know, you sick of why are you taking pictures of these dead and wounded people? But he knew his job as a photographer when he did it. But Terry was out there taking pictures for another reason. And he was carrying a 38 caliber revolver. At a certain point, someone starts chasing him, saying, Stop that man. He just fired. So there is a theory that those were the first shots fired. Like the photographer? Yeah. That that the guard heard his pistol shots going off and turned in response. That's never been proved. <laughs> Terry himself um, ran to the guardsman's position, uh, explained what had happened, that people had been hassling him and he'd taken out his gun and fired to scare them off. And he turned it over to um, Tom Murphy, who was the, the campus plaintiff clothes me, and he knew that your school had an undercover cop, right? <laughs> um, and news cameramen <clears throat> heard Norman say, I fired four times. In the official report, Tom Murphy said the gun had not been fired. Subsequently, two Expended cartridges, 38 cartridges were found in an alley outside of Yale. That same Tom Murphy later recommended Terry Norman to the Washington, D.C. police, where he served for 12 years. Near the end of those 12 years, he was demoted and no longer allowed to carry a gun. And 
as a duty. After that, he went into business, working for a corporation. And a few years later, um, he was charged with mail fraud uh, for $675,000, about the equivalent of two and a half million today. And he spent three and a half years in federal prison. And then the last I know of him, he was a used car salesman in Asheville, North Carolina, living 10 miles off the grid and getting no interviews. <laughs> The other major theory is that this man, Sergeant Myron Pryor, conspired on the practice football, football field, as some of his colleagues, in effect, saying, you know, we've had enough of these kids coming to an England. Because it's alleged by some witnesses that he tapped for the garden, who then turned around and said, you know, that's one of the things. I say he contends that he never fired the ball himself. Almost as peculiar as the event itself is the aftermath. 15, uh, 10 or 15 days later, the local prosecutor, Ronald Kane, <clears throat> had this news conference. He had gone in and searched the room. Kent State University was closed down, as you can imagine. Buses were supplied to carry students to train supplies in Akron and Cleveland. And after the campus was emptied out, Ron Kane went in with his police and searched all the dorm rooms, looking for weapons. And he's displaying here all of the kinds of things they found, which is some of which, and you can't really tell in the pictures, I mean, it's pretty much anything that's longer than it is wide, uh, you know, it's conceivably used as a club. Um, some of it like starter pistols that people use for, um, for races. Uh, or seriously, he then convened a county grand jury. And a few months later, the grand jury brought in 25 indictments against 24 students and one faculty member. No guardsmen, no university officials. Uh, the reaction, as you can imagine, was shock. Although there, there was an odd sort of feeling that, how oh, come I wasn't one of the 25? You know? <laughs> Ultimately, uh, those people went to trial. Two of them fled to riot and got probation. The charges were dropped against all the others. Then, a few years later, the federal government came in, the Justice Department, and put eight of the guardsmen on trial. But the judge stopped the proceedings in the middle and declared that there was not sufficient evidence that these guardsmen had deprived the students of their civil rights. And that was the end of that. Then there was a civil trial. The families of the victims sued. And Governor Rhodes and the other officials invoked sovereign immunity, the notion that because they were state officials doing state business, we could not be sued as individuals. That eventually went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court knocked it down. They went on trial, and they were acquitted by a jury in Cleveland. Finally, I don't know how, there was yet another civil trial in 1977. And in that trial, <clears throat> there was an agreement. Um, the guard did not have to acknowledge guilt, but the families were given $675,000, as I said, about $2.8 million today. Uh, about, they conferred, 
and they decided to give about half of it to Dean Taylor, who was paralyzed. Some of the other people got small amounts, and the families of the dead got $15,000 each. Equivalent of $60,000 today. The other aftermath was the attempt to commemorate this, to memorialize it in some way. This was a statuary figure proposed by George Siegel, Abraham and Isaac. Isaac was a nice about it. Willing to slay his son because he's his son. Willing to be here. Um, the university rejected this. <laughs> and what you actually have at Kent State today is this nice, peaceful, abstract construction. And these markers that go around the spots where this was built. And every year there's a commemoration to this. But for me, the real memorial is up here on Bunker Hill. This is where the garden stood. This was their perspective. And there was this data in their hall, the parking lot. <coughs> and right in the middle is a steel sculpture called Sunny Totem by a, a local sculptor named Don Cologne, who was erected in 1967. And it's composed of a hundred steel plates plate is half an inch thick. And one of those plates uh, is this bullet hole. It's seen through a steel jacket around the town. And you could go and stick your little finger in it and, and look through and see this path to this parking lot. And that to me is the real complete memorial. So Russell and I will talk about <laughs> his experience there. Thank you very much. Yeah. with lesson in school um, uh, with a lot of 
images and stories, um, which is very different from the inf information and the images that I found on internet, the internet when I had access to the internet. And uh, in 2014, um, uh, with some keywords on Google, I found this uh, this book about uh, the collection of uh, photographic history photograph by Associated Press. It's called Vietnam the New World. Um, and the photograph of Kan Sen Su with this size. And from this side, I make the project um, with my own way of understanding. And, um, from all that I have experienced uh, within the world, like within the family, the real experience um, with, with the world. Um, and this year, when I have a bit of chance to have a fellowship with Asian Country Council, um, I um, had the chance to visit Jane uh, at Asia Arakai's. And from this, I to have a talk and I make my own visit to uh, Kent State in, in Ohio and uh, from all that you see uh, from uh, Richard Vine's uh, presentation is all about uh, history facts, it's about timeline, what happened, what we see from history. Um, from my research to Kent State uh, in May 4th, um, two months ago, it's all about my way of understanding it. Again, it's about my, my question, why? This is my way to uh, Kent State. Um, this is a taxi driver uh, from the airport um, to uh, to Penn State. It takes about 45 minutes, and on the way uh, we have a long conversation about where I'm from, why I'm here. A very uh, like it's not a place for a place for tourists to come to visit. <laughs> why I'm here and uh, what part of Asia that I'm from. We have a long story with this bed of the front, front seat, so the, these are all the images I took along the way. When I found the image in the, in the in that book, I showed it to my parents and uh, asked them if uh, they had ever seen that photograph ever before. They say they have never seen that. Uh, and um, to me it's quite a surprise because um, as a country like Vietnam, like people might think that all those sort of uh, photos could be a way to teach my generation about what the American uh, has done in, in Vietnam and it's, it could be a good propagandic way to teach us to build a hatred over this country. But um, those, those images uh, uh, were, the, were all uh, ones that but like, like I saw the first time. And uh, apart from the uh, uh, we're just the ones that we, we might all have known is that the Mount Pango or the the Mon the the emulation mode uh, and all that jazz. But the, that catalog to me is a big surprise and that's the way that leads me to work on the project. Uh, our uh, 
situation with the, the taxi driver was suddenly stopped by this uh, barricade. And it uh, actually is the, the car park um, where the Kansai shooting happened uh, in uh, 1970. This is how it looked like on the Maple, uh, Lux Maple. It was raining that day.
from uh, Vietnam War to the whole uh, next to uh, the car park. They have one very big concert uh, there. And it was 11.20, just five minutes before um, I think the National Guard started the first building on the main court in 1970. I spent whole day in uh, the mm. State University, and it's uh, the field that I like take. And I spent time with all the students there um, to, it's like, to really feel how, how it was like in uh, the university that has that uh, horrible event. Um, many, many years ago when I wasn't born, um, to have the question like, are they really remember what happened? Um, uh, what happened in in that year? And um, all the photographs about Vietnam and the U.S. in both sides, like like myself, are they have the curiosity? to bring them to Vietnam to see what happened in Vietnam in, uh, uh, in the year before the 1975, like me or not. So I spent all day with them and to see what uh, they were doing uh, the whole day at the canteen and around the uh, university.
played by, um, I chose to do the performance of what is the um, ice cream factory. Um, when I grew up, it was like uh, a dream for every uh, little kid in Vietnam to have ice cream in that uh, every weekend or once per month. Six years old, it's like a dream for everyone. Um, um, and also, um, when I I chose to lay down the basement, I expect um, many people, many pedestrians, to come by and ask, like, why, why do you lie down here? Um, what do you imitate? Um, um, what's the point of? Dressing up like this and uh, being in this rainy day, lying there, what do you want to say to us? And with um, with that project, I I um, had help from uh, one uh, very young photographer, one um, young uh, graphic designer to um, take them to places. And uh, in the end, we, we make the some kind of poster to show in the gallery play, place with all the keywords about Kansai shooting. Um, one of um, the, main, the, the keywords was Jeffrey Miller, Kansai shooting 1970. Um, for people to really put them on their smartphone and to look up what, what happened that day. And what I want really to say with uh, the images and with the performance I did um, with the project. And uh, excuse me, Cheryl, we don't have a window or something. I just I can't stay here any better. <laughs> we can't get some air. Sorry to interrupt. It's just like sometimes. And I also expect um, questions during my um, conversation. So, um, yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. How long were you lying there in total to the length of time of being on the ground? Uh, it was uh, 15 minutes. And no one stopped? Uh, there was just two young men on motorbike. And they, they stopped. And no one yeah. stopped. Yeah. No one yeah. really stopped. Yeah. Yeah. It was raining. Like the day I came to Ken last May. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was in Vietnam a few years ago, I noticed that everyone there called it the American War. So I was wondering, when did you first hear the term the Vietnam War? Um, I also call it the uh, American War. Like, um, like when I talk to my friends, and um, and it was just like um, four or five years ago when I start working with many uh, international artists who come to Vietnam, and I have the habit of calling Vietnam War and like with publication of uh, keep calling it Vietnam War. So. Um, Japan. Yeah, it's the way, like, like international way of yeah. calling something. Like, yeah. So I call it the American. <laughs> um, actually, last year when uh, yeah, which American? Uh, in the yeah, no, Last year when I presented my work to a Thai artist, and uh, I called it Vietnam War, and he corrected me immediately, like. Oh, it's a surprise that you call it Vietnam War. Um, and I was like, it's like um, really something for me that I really have to rethink about what I have been seeing and absorbed. <laughs> Or is it all just that inherited by the Americans? 
to Americans also in, at that point of time. I think the young people in the U.S. Oh, <laughs> Uh, they didn't know why they were sent to Vietnam and had to spend time in in the forest uh, and to kill the people that they had. They do not know the language. They do not know um, what is the lifestyle like, what is the weather is like, and I'm sure. I'm sure that um, we all do not understand why uh, what would ha happen uh, at both sides at, at, at that point of time. And to me, I'm still learning from my, my parents, from their acumen, from what and who would wrong or why. Like, is it why uh, my, my, my dad always says that we should not fight, uh, fight back the, the American because that was done that brought uh, the better economy to the south of Vietnam. That was done to build uh, the control of that build up many things, many good things, we should have found another way to deal with that. And my mom was like, um, I believe in what my friend, uh, in, in, in my parents has done to the French, so I believe that, that was why that we should chase them away. And to me, it's always a question, and I'm still finding the question from people from my work also, uh, from the images that I found, from all the texts that I had a chance to read. So far. The history is so deep. I have two questions. Yeah. So, and I'm okay. <laughs> um, so you're from a place where memory is really important, and the way that people are managing memory is happening all the time. Even in the short time I've known you, the you know they changed the name of the museum, the, this sorts of thing. My two questions, and, and I see how you're like trying to play with and think about how these memories that come down to you. Sort of distill. How can you overlap them with your own life? With, 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 with. Where do you think the memory of the war is going? Like so, how? So when I think when I first met you, it was the War of American Aggression Museum. Now it's the War Remnants Museum. Where do you think this memory is going now? Like where do you see it going in terms of the, the rapidly changing you know, Vietnam's rapid change? I think now um, the, gen the generation after me that have so many ways to uh, to um, to go to archives, to go to uh, many resources of information, and they could find very many precise, I think, to them the information that they could get that included in their work or in the research. And they would somehow rewrite the book or write a novel by themselves, which no one has ever done before. Um, and that is the way I think um, their memory is processed. And that would be in like, Vietnamese Hollywood, in a way, mm. and that would make people believe that, like, the things that I'm doing here is nothing related to Hollywood, it's all by, like, my personal trip to Ohio, to 
to the things that I heard from my parents, like, is open myself. And to the young people, they have better camera, um, a skillful way to write a story. They will create a novelistic sort of memory for the next generation in a beautiful way that people can trust. <laughs> you know, the American military always said we lost the war because of the American federal government.
in this first one and that, okay, Vietnam in Southeast Asia, we own the position that is so important to capitalism, but we are socialist countries, uh, socialist countries. And we were right next to China, we were right next to East Asia, and that, that position is so important to the US. Yes. So, after after the after the shooting in the days and weeks afterwards, what were your feelings? Yeah. Anyone has somebody, please feel free to leave. Okay, we've gone way over. So maybe we can give a, a hand to everybody. <laughs>